All right, well, welcome to our second session of the Parish Faith Forum, and I want to start with an apology, because I did something last week that I, from the moment I started and, 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 and went through the talk and uh, thought about it afterwards, sometimes we think that we're really the ones that are going to make the Lord's work happen. Now, we're his instruments, and that's true. And so sometimes we put the pressure on ourselves. Now, I've been given talks, you know, throughout the Archdiocese since I was in college. And um, whether people enjoy them or not, I'm very adept at just, you know, being, you know, being very conversational. And that's how I prefer for it to be. Um, but last week, last Wednesday, I set myself up. I had all these notes because I thought, I got it, Lord, I got to get this, I got to get this perfect. Okay. Now, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. And if you want to make him laugh, tell him you're going to, it's got to be, you're going to make it perfect, okay? And so what happened was I got encumbered by the notes, and I, you know, even when I was listening back, I was, it was okay, but I just felt like I wasn't really talking with you. So now, tonight, I'm, I'm going to repent of that. I told Brenda and uh, Kristen, I said, if you see as much as a gum wrapper up here, I want you to take it away from me. I want nothing up here, um, because really what I like to do is just give you a testimony. You know, there's the story of the uh, demoniac from that village of Jeresa. And, um, <clears throat> see, this is going to happen a little bit tonight. So those of you out in YouTube land, you're really going to enjoy it even more. But anyway, um, and he was, a, he, was, he was possessed with demons. And the Lord was passing through that town, near that town. And uh, that's the one where he asks the demons, our Lord does, what is your name? And they respond, our, our, my name is Legion for there are many of us. And so he casts those uh, demons out of the man and they locate themselves in a herd of swine who are so frenzied by the demonic activity even among just animals that they drowned themselves in the sea. And uh, of course the whole town of Jeresa said, okay, we're glad he's not running around day and night scaring us, this guy that was possessed by demonics. But in a way, Jesus, you scare us even more. So would you just take yourself and just go somewhere else, okay? Because um, they couldn't handle the power that this rabbi had over even, even the spirits. And so Jesus is never going to force himself on any one of us, and he didn't do that even while he walked on this earth. And so they're getting in the boat to go back to the other side of the, of the lake, and, and the fellow who's been healed, he wants to get in the boat. He wants to become a disciple wants to get in the boat with them and go with them. And Jesus says, you know, this boat isn't meant for you, but this is your vocation now. Go back to your people and to your village and to everyone you meet and you tell them everything that the Lord has done for you. And that's what I really see my vocation as. I don't know how in the, in the living world I ended up in, in, in doing any of this. And, and, and being compensated for it, if you will, making my living at it. Some of you may be wondering that too, and that's okay, because um, the, the point I'm making here is that all, all, all I'm here to do is to share with you what God has put into my heart. And um, I always tell the, the RCIA people, and, you know, as we get closer to the end of the year, and you guys will hear this again and, and when we get to March, Bottom line is this, if the Lord can make something work with me, I'm kind of a model. If, if this guy can make it, uh, at least pretend to make it in the kingdom of God, the rest of you, you're in. No problem. Okay. So I just want to give witness. I don't want to give it, I don't want to teach class. And I want to give time for you to have, uh, hopefully at the end, some interaction. I preface that with the, I don't care what topic we're, you can look on the schedule. This one is going to be the hardest one. You see what the nutshell page looks like. Um, it's just chock full of, of words. And I like, as opposed to last week, where it was just kind of an outline. But this, this, one, this one takes us from understanding myself, that I exist, to understanding that there is a God. And this is going to impact every one of us in some way. Because of all of you out there, you either have children who no longer believe in God and practice their faith, you're going to have children who are no longer to believe, or they're going to be tempted to no longer believe in God and practice their faith. You will have grandchildren. You have brothers and sisters. We're, we're all surrounded by people whom we love and care for, 
who have given up. And some of them are just hurt because maybe we haven't done as good a job being Christians. We like to blame it on the priests or the Pope. But you know the bottom line is? If we did a better job, and I'm putting that on all of us, if we did a better job of showing Christ, maybe they'd, maybe they'd be around a little more. That's a little heavy. I'm not trying to lay anything heavy on us. But, but, but sometimes, as Thomas Merton said, sometimes the reason someone's lost their faith is because he's saying not to you or to me, but to the person he's speaking, is because you sucked it out of them by professing to be a Christian and being an awful, awful low example of it. So that's why we're having these forums, so we can get energized. But there's also stuff that's okay for us to say to people's faces. I remember President Reagan giving a talk one time, and um, he said, you know, I don't understand the atheist. And, and sometimes I have an unholy desire to gather as many atheists as I can to the White House and invite them to dinner and to provide them with a sumptuous meal and then after the meal is over say to them you never met the chef does that mean you don't believe in the dinner because that's a lot of times what what we're what we're aiming at we, we, we want to see we want to be convinced faith is hard faith is really hard and we want to have proof we want to have you know, assurance that, that I'm not wasting my time by living these virtues, that I'm not wasting my time by, by, by being in this situation or doing this vocation or whatever that you have. That, in other words, that it really, really matters and it really makes a difference because it's really, really real. And my testimony to you tonight is that it is really, really real. I quoted last week from the Gospel of John, the prologue. Let's review some of that. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to be through him, and there is nothing that came to be that did not come to be through him. In him was life, and this life was the light of the world. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness cannot overcome it, cannot comprehend it, cannot outwit it, whatever word you want to use. I used to call this talk that I would give in RCIA a reasonable faith. Tonight we're calling it faith, reason, and response. But a reasonable faith implies that what we believe is believable. When we gather on Good Friday uh, for the solemn service of the Lord's Passion and we read from the 53rd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah, there's that line that I always wait for in anticipation. And most years, I curse it by my anticipation of it, um, except this last year, if, I, if I'm correct, because Bruce Steinbach read it perfectly. Now, we've got good, good lectures here, and, and they read it well, but, but it, it's, it, it, if you're not, if you're not you, you gotta think about it. Who would believe what we had heard? That's the line from Isaiah. And we might translate into, who would believe the things that we believe? In a world with all kinds of different religious points of view and faiths and, and, and all these sorts of, why would anyone believe what we believe? But going back to the even more fundamental question, why today would anyone believe in God? And the atheist, who's not so much against God, as he or she tends to be against people who believe in God, because you can't really be against something that doesn't exist. So the atheist doesn't have a hang-up with God. Actually, they do, because I never have really met a, a true atheist. There's always something when you try to drive them to the point, well, how do you explain love? Or, or how do you explain people who choose kindness? You know, and then they talk about this kind of unanimity of spirit and this goodness that pervades, this essential goodness that pervades the human race. And, 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 I, I, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't want to jump the gun on them, but I, but I, but I also want to say, well, where do you think that came from? Where do you think that came from? The question I could ask you, maybe I asked it last week, I don't remember, 
Anyone here created themselves or willed their own being before they were created? Yeah, we'll get to that um, here in a little bit. Anybody the source of their own goodness? When you do something that's really, really good and you know it and it's right, do you look in the mirror and go, I'm right, scored? No, we, we give the glory, the credit to God. Which is why we believe wherever we see goodness, wherever we see the genuine attempt at love, we're seeing God in action there. The atheists cannot always understand that. The 12-step programs, as good as they are, they've taken this you know, step two higher power and they, they allow people to, to call that God, but some people call that higher power their coffee cup or the energy of the, of the particular 12-step group or, or this thing deep within. As I said last week, the young man knocking at the door of the brothel was looking for God. Man is an inherently religious being. And yet people will still refuse to believe. Well, this isn't just a product of our era. Back in the 13th century, St. Thomas Aquinas tackled this as well. And that's what makes this night so hard because we're going to talk about we're going, to, we're going to try to describe things in philosophical, philosophical terms. And it's not that I'm, I'm saying you guys are too much big of dummies to understand any of that, but it, it does get a little bit where, you, where you, you, you can't go so linear as much as you kind of have to circle, you know, do, a, do a pattern circle for a little while in your brain. But I think if we walk through it, you'll have the basis in which to tell your children, your grandchildren, your relatives, your friends, all of those who have given up, and, and again, most of them haven't given up on God. They've given up on the church. But it's, 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 if we do the foundation right, the rest of it, I think, will come. Or at least we'll be able to say to them, my faith is reasonable. And there is a reason for what I believe. St. Thomas Aquinas called it his five ways of proving the existence of God. Now already the scientists laugh because he's using that word in a way that we don't use it today. We think if we've proven something that it is factual and can be analyzed in a petri dish or in a wavelength or you know in whatever you know in a Geiger counter something like that. What basically St. Thomas Aquinas is saying is there are five ways of reasoning that there is a God. Because as the old adage goes, to those who have faith, no proof is necessary. And to those who have no faith, no proof will suffice. The five ways. The first one is motion. Everything that we observe in creation and in nature is moving. But nothing begins to move itself. You were created, knitted, as the Bible says, in the womb of your mother, each of us. And yet, that's what caused us to, to begin movement. Nothing begins its own movement. It's moved by another force, moved by another mover. And so this is moved first by this, and this itself was moved first by another, and, and that was moved itself by another. Here's the problem with reason and logic. Uh, if, if we, you know, here's, here's where reason and logic have a problem with this. You cannot have an infinite regression. It's, it's not logical that this has just gone on forever. Reason dictates that eventually you come up with someone who moves but is not moved by another. Someone in whom movement originates. St. Thomas Aquinas says, that's, that's God, the first mover, the first and unmoved mover. What St. Thomas Aquinas did in most of his work was he tried to pair, he tried, he was very successful. His quest was to pair incontrovertible truths, one in the category of, of faith, the other in the category of reason, and to reconcile them. And that's why he relied so heavily on on Greek philosophy. So for instance, we know that God does not gratuitously create people simply to damn them. We're not Calvinists. We do not believe that God creates people who have no hope or no chance of salvation. 
that he has predestined the lucky us sitting down here in Yardridge Hall, you know, and the, the guys that are, you know, cracking peanuts at five guys. Hmm, sorry, it doesn't work that way. So we know that God does not gratuitously create people simply to have them be lost. At the same time, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the bread of life. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you cannot abide in me, and I will not abide in you. And you cannot have eternal life. And sometimes Christians have used these statements over the centuries to go, aha, see, we have it, and y'all don't. So you either better come with us as explicitly as possible. And if you have any hesitation, therein lies your damnation. That's never what the church has taught. That's not what St. Thomas Aquinas taught. It's never what the church has taught. So that when we get to the 1960s and the Second Vatican Council and the Declaration on Religious Liberty, there were a group of Christians, they just built a big church about 35 minutes west of here, who believe that that document it's not the work of the Holy Spirit, but is in error. Because they believe that error possesses no rights. And that outside the church, literally, there can be no salvation. Thomas Aquinas said, here's two incontrovertible truths. Number one, God does not gratuitously create people simply to condemn them. And there's no way that we can get to every single person on the planet today, even then, and convince them of the gospel. That doesn't mean that they have denied, they just have not heard of it in a way that springs faith. All too often it's because they listen to what we say, and I'm not picking on us at Christ the King, or us in Topeka, or us in Kansas, but they listen to what Christians sometimes have to say, and then they look at how Christians act, and they go, that doesn't reconcile, so I think I'll, I think I'll try something else. But at the same time, Christ made it very clear, without me, you're lost. So Aquinas began to reason that there are those who through no fault of their own have not heard the gospel, have not had an acquaintance with God that engenders faith. And through no fault of their own means that they're not going to be held liable for it. They too have the opportunity to act as the Second Vatican Council said so beautifully quoting St. Thomas Aquinas, under the inspiration of grace. Now we as Catholics, we know that grace comes from the sacraments. And those people don't have the sacraments, so how does that work? St. Thomas Aquinas answered that many, many years ago. Over in the 21st century, he was in the 13th, 800 years ago. Deus non allegator sacramentum, God is not relegated to the sacraments. The simple way of putting it is God will save whomever God wants to save. Which, even though it's a little bit of a rabbit hole, it's, it's one of many times that I will tell you. When you die, okay, and you open your eyes, and you find yourself in heaven, or at least before the throne of God, one thing, one thing you say, mercy. When Pope John Paul II died and stood before the throne of God, he did not talk about being the second longest reigning pope, and John Paul the Great, who had a hand in defeating communism and all this other stuff. Mercy. He happened to be holding the hand of Our Lady, to whom he was very close the whole time while on earth. When Mother Teresa stand before the, the throne of God on the occasion of her death, she did not say, I founded this religious order, I won a Nobel Peace Prize, here, here are my terms of negotiation to get me on the other side of that door. She said one word, the fathers tell us, mercy. So that's number one. Number two, don't act surprised, but especially don't act upset by anybody else you see up there, okay? Because you're going to get in trouble for that. Okay, so you don't go, mercy, what the, you know, don't do that, okay? Don't do that, okay? Motion dictates that there has to be a starting point. That starting point is God. See how Aquinas is taking nature and reason and applying it to faith. Ours is a reasonable faith. In fact, even though the church always says, fides et ratio, faith and reason, 
as the two means by which we can come to know the living God, really it, it begins with, with reason. Most of us are reasonable about it, and then revelation builds us in our faith. But we'll get to that. Second, causality. Things are created, and yet none of us has created ourself. I was caused into being by the action of my parents. Father Steve Bissot at the Catholic Campus Center at, at, at KU one time preached a homily in which he said, did you ever stop and think about it? If great, 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 great grandma had said on one particular night to great, 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 great grandpa, not tonight, Buster, you wouldn't exist. I did not create myself. I was created by another that caused me to be. And they were created, and this is true about everything, not just people, were created by something else that caused them to be. And those things were created by something else that caused them to be, because none of us can create ourselves. But again, we use the term infinite regression. It's a fancy term. Throw that at the cocktail party. You are going to get another drink, okay? Um, infinite regression. We cannot have an infinite regression that goes on forever. Well, well, this was created by this, which 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 was created by this. Reason dictates, demands, that there is one who creates, but who is not created. And that is God. So we have motion and causality. We also have what St. Thomas Aquinas calls contingency. It's possible for you and I to exist, but it's possible for you and I not to, to exist. And that's what Father Basso was talking about. If way back 150 years ago, 50 years ago, 1,000 years ago, the chain reaction was started in what we pray was the loving embrace of a husband and wife, and that's how I got to be here. You take one step out of that, I'm gone. So contingency dictates that it is possible for things to exist, but it's also possible for things not to exist. But if things are possible not to exist, then we would have big holes in, in, in creation, because nothing's guaranteed to exist. Aquinas says there has to be some thing that is necessary, that is not contingent on what great 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 grandma and great 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 grandpa decide, or on the seasons, or on the effects of the so-called Big Bang, or any of those things. You know, as, as true as those things can be, there has to be something that is necessary, that is not contingent. Because if the whole world, the whole universe, all of creation, all of reality is contingent, then it, we, we wouldn't be here. That non-contingent, that necessary being is God. Now these aren't the things that you're going to go over to, you know, uh, you know, uh, Sam's Club and start telling people, and they're going to go, "Yeah, I used to go to church. I stopped believing in God." Oh, let me tell you this, brother. This isn't the kind of stuff. But but we're, we're setting the stage here because everything that's said after tonight, I guarantee you, is reasonable. I'll guarantee you, whether Father Matthew says it, whether Father Thomas says it, even if I say it, it's reasonable. At least the stuff that the church teaches. Now, if I'm telling you about, you know, stuff, or like, you know, other weird stuff, then, you know, that's just me. Bonus, bonus points. But everything that the church teaches and everything that's going to be articulated after tonight is reasonable. And so when people stop believing rather than shun them, even though it is very painful for us, or, or to despair them, and it is, it's very despairing, I like to jump start. A lot of people's faith. Sometimes all that would require is a swift kick in the pants, but you know, then there are laws. So we can't always do that. We have we know that we have the foundation to patiently and carefully give witness to our faith. 
because it is based entirely on reason. Perfection, the fourth way. We say some things are better than others. Um, I remember one time my own grandparents and grandma had baked a pie and we ate the pie and she said to everybody at the table, you know, I'm not sure that was the, the best pie. I, I, I hope that pie was edible. She would always say that though, okay? I hope that meal was edible. And I always wanted to say, well, grandma, that's just how desperate we were. It was not, <laughs> but we need nutrients. Okay? So we got it down. No, seriously. But she was kind of one of those, you know, so we could all, you know, this wasn't her whole thing, okay? But she wanted us to go, oh, yeah, no, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. One time, granddad called her bluff. And he didn't do it out of spite. He did it because he was an honest man without guile. He said, yeah, mother, I got to admit, it wasn't your best effort tonight. Well, she didn't like hearing that. <laughs> but it was true. It really wasn't her best effort. I thought the crust was a little soggy. We rate things as being better, better than. We also rate things as being worse than. Okay. If you had your druthers, this used to be a game that people would play. Um, you know, would you rather have a bowling ball dropped on your face, or would you rather have your leg run over by a tank? You know, both of those are just not good. But you got to figure out which one you'd rather have, and they're kind of like just stupid, stupid human questions. But we do rate things as better. I like the examples that. Uh, that uh, I, I kind of saw that I, I put in, in your, your nutshell sheet tonight. Well-drawn circles are better than poorly drawn circles. That's just a fact. Well-played violins are better than poorly played violins. It's just a fact. Well-played clarinets. <laughs> yeah, sure. Anyway, some things are better than others. Other examples, healthy people, healthy animals are better than sick animals. Yep, aren't they? Anybody want to disagree? It's an open forum. Being an animal is better than being a plant. Who would give up their, who would give up their, the, the, the animation of being a creature who knows, just an ordinary animal, or the human person, the creature who knows and who knows that he knows, the human person, in order to have the longevity of a sequoia tree? or one of those turtles that lives 250 years. Who would do that? Nobody would. Of course you'd rather be a hammer than a nail, because a hammer is better, okay? But when we say something is better, logic implies that we're able to rate, and there therefore must be some kind of a spectrum not that spectrum that most of our kids and grandkids are on, but I mean a spectrum of, 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 of perfection. By the way, I, I'm on that spectrum, so I'm not making fun of your kids or grandkids, okay? If you haven't figured that out, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do for you. But anyway, it implies that there is better. And, and if there's something better than another, there's something pulling that up that makes it better. It's not just a fact. It's, 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 it's on, it's on a, a plane, a trajectory, which implies that the third place pie at the county fair is good. The second place pie at the county fair is better. In the limitation of that particular contest, that first place pie of those three and the other dozen or so that were baked and entered is the best. But is it really the best? Because some will say, well, that was the best at, you know, at the Leavenworth County Fair, but if you go over to the Douglas County Fair, it's a lot better over there. Because they got the piles in Eudora, and Mrs. Pyle makes pies like you wouldn't even believe. If you know who Mrs. Pyle is, you know what I'm talking about. And I got many other. They have nobody like that in Leavenworth County. Okay. The things we do in Kansas, we could say are better than the things they do in Missouri. Okay? Because even though we in Kansas are spinning our wheels most of the time, in Missouri they make meth. See? See how it works? Okay. 
It implies that if we can say something is better, then there has to be, reason dictates that there is at least a theoretical best. But it's not really theoretical because we're talking about created things and so we, we know we can make those comparisons. That best thing, most good, most noble, is God. The standard by which everything else is, is judged, if you will. And we're fortunate. You think, well, what, why does it have to be like that? Because if it weren't like that, we'd either be in or we'd be out. And who wants to go with that? I, I'd rather go into heaven limping along as I will go in, knowing that there is a blessed Virgin Mary to whom I can look up to, whom I will never be. I will never be the blessed Virgin Mary. And I'm not talking about in life circumstance. I'm talking about in virtue. There will never be, I, I will never be St. Joseph. I'll never be the unnamed companion of Cleophas walking back to Emmaus on Easter Sunday. I won't even be that guy when Jesus was arrested whose clothes fell off and he ran off into the nighttime naked. Did you ever wonder why, the God, why God wanted that detail in there? You ever wonder about stuff like that? Why, 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 Lord, why did you have to put that part in? I mean, that's a reason. This hasn't been... We haven't figured it out. I'm not even going to be that guy. There's a prayer that I and my colleagues begin many mornings with in the office here called the Litany of Humility. And the most curious of all of the... You know, it's, if you know the Litany of Humility, uh, you know, from the desire of being esteemed, deliver me Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me Jesus. When you work in a parish office, that prayer is answered within two minutes after you've prayed it. Because there's someone at the door not happy. Okay? That's parish life, right? That's not just Christ the King, that's everywhere. Okay? Oh, y'all here are champions at it. But it's everywhere, okay? God, nah, just teasing. There's a curious, the last one was always curious to me. And I struggled with it when I was a young person for many, 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 many seasons. Until I realized, until I just, I just sat with it. And that is that others may be holier than I. Now, who would really want that? I, you know, does that glorify God? Ah, it's the second part. That's where I was getting stuck, too. That others may be holier than I. Well, that means that I'm somehow refusing or resisting grace, perhaps. That others may be holier than I, provided that I'm as holy as I ought to be. In other words, I'm as holy as you created me to be. And the truth of the matter is, God created the Blessed Virgin Mary to be holier than you and I. God created St. Joseph to be holier than all of the fathers and grandfathers in this room. And that doesn't mean we're failing, but Joseph had his own station. And we're content with that. Because we know that we are being drawn upward on that spectrum of perfection. That we are seeking to be in communion with that perfect one. And that perfect one is God. There's nobody better than God. <clears throat> Finally, purpose. Do you ever wonder how the atheist gets around the idea that there's order? Order really has to be intended. If, if you don't live order in your own life, you're going to have disorder. Now, I have two very dear people that work in the office with, uh, with me here at Christ the King, and they both have very, very clean desks. Now, one of them makes a big mess throughout the day, but she always cleans it before she leaves. I won't mention her name, but her initials are Kristen Cole. Okay. She makes it a point to clean off her desk. Now, Rome, sweet Rome, uh, home week had all of us a little frazzled. My desk looks like my. It looks like a bomb went off. Okay, and and I keep talking about when I get caught up, when I get caught up, when I get. And, and it, it it will happen. Now, hope springs eternal, but that just tends to be the nature. It, and I know that the the key is not when things get easier, but when I decide to get really hold myself to the fire and get organized. And that's not always easy for melancholic phlegmatics. I digress. Order has to be intended. So when we observe order in nature, especially among non-intelligent beings, okay? So 
We see order in creation among non-intelligent beings, and we say, that has to have been designed that way. Because we know that non-intelligent beings cannot order themselves because they don't have the capacity. They're, they're non-intelligent. And we also know that there's not order in creation because I've bequeathed order upon it or because we as a human community have bequeathed order upon it. Whatever side of the fence you set in these kinds of things, we do know that, you know, and this is where our faith keeps us right in the middle, right, the sweet spot. We do know that we have a great need to be good stewards of the earth, and if we don't take care of things, that they can get a little less, okay? That's why you really should not fish in the Kansas River and then eat it, okay? Don't do that. Yeah, well, I've, I've been doing that for 15 years. That's why you have six fingers on your left hand, pal, okay? <laughs> because, and again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, because we wouldn't have a lot of wheat and a lot of corn and a lot of bread and a lot of, well, we're not supposed to eat that stuff anyway, anymore, they tell us. But my point being this, we're going to have an impact. And because we don't have control but to have an impact. So in this weird way, I'm going to say this, landfills are necessary. Because even if you're living organically, potato peelings are going to go bad. So we, nature, cannot declare or decree order over nature. There has to be one who designs things to behave and to cooperate in predictable and healthful patterns. There will always be anomalies. But that's the whole point, they're anomalies. The fact of the matter is, is that the universe, whether one believes in God or not, sustains order. And the difference between the person who does believe in God and the person who doesn't believe in God, and again, we're not picking on the atheist for whatever reason, they haven't gotten there, hopefully yet. And again, not hopefully yet, because man, they're really, I wanna see them roast on jet. We don't, don't say stuff like that, okay? No, because, they're missing out on a lot of great things by believing. That should be the real reason, isn't it, that our, sometimes our children and our grandchildren and our brothers and sisters and our family members and our neighbors have given up. Because, number one, we miss them. Heaven's not going to be as much fun without you. And it's probably not going to be as much fun without me. We're, we're all called to be there. So it's not that part, even. It's the fact that, gosh, for those of us that have Christ in our life, and, and that is an engaged relationship, oh my gosh. That's why those of you in RCIA, now I will never say this after 7.30 in, 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 with this kind of zeal, because remember, RCIA is a, is a place to discern. Man, I want you to be Catholic. And I'll be so bold as to say, I'd like you to be the kind of Catholic I am. But what is he saying? Where does he get off saying that? It's based on one thing, how good the Lord has been to me. Maybe I'm the worst kind of Catholic. Well, then we all, I want you all to be the worst kind of Catholic because, oh man, is the Lord good to me. And he can be good even to the worst kind of Catholic. Well, there's your chance. It's because God is good. And God in my life is good, and therefore I want God in everyone's life. But going back to the atheist, the atheist has to find a way to explain order. Because it's not logical that, occur, that it occurs on its own. Therefore, there has to be one who is capable of assigning patterns of behavior, who is capable of assigning purposes. And that is God. Now that's all fine and good, okay? A little bit of philosophy with St. Thomas Aquinas, and maybe we've not gone much through more than a mental exercise here. But for me, it helps me to hold on when the going gets a little tough. For as good as the Lord has been to me, and he's been nothing but good. Oh my God, I love thee above all things with my whole heart and soul, because thou art all good and deserving of all my love. In other words, because thou has done nothing but good to me. Even the way I say the act of contrition. 
I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, the consequences of my sin. Because by my sin I have offended my neighbor whom I should love as myself, yea, even as you have loved me. Because by my sin I have offended even myself, denying myself the happiness for which you created me out of a gratuitous love. But most of all, most of all, I detest all my sins because by them I have offended you, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love, who have only blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. So why aren't things going better for Michael's life in some areas? Because he spent too much time responding with curse after curse after curse after curse. And I don't mean curse like this, you know, and for those of you just listening, I just raise my, my fist to God. Not that kind of cursing. But because I denied, I got this, Lord. Oh, no, I, I'm going to be perfect. I, I, you, you just stay over there and watch me be perfect. Oh, hold my beer, Lord. This is, oh, is going to be good, you see. Or, yeah, God, I love you, but I want this other thing over here right now. See, that's where, it's, that's where the thing is falling apart. God has only been good to me. Why do we believe? How do we believe? Why do we believe and how do we believe? I believe because God revealed himself to me through my, through my parents, through my family, through lots of wonderful people. But they're all sinners. So sometimes they didn't quite reveal it the way that I think God wanted it, because none of us are, you know, we're all sinners, right? Who am I? A beloved child of God in need of God's grace, because I am a sinner. God revealed himself to me. I don't understand this. And I'm not saying this to impress you, because when I tell you these things, for you to look at me now, is for me to be revealing to you just how little I've done with this. Because God made himself real to me when I was four years old. I do not know why. It just came to me all of a sudden, and it never left. That's not a boast. I had nothing to do with it. Just like Mary can't boast of her immaculate conception. And what I've experienced isn't even near to that. In fact, all I can do is stand before you in shame, because for someone, <coughs> who for 52 years God has invited into a personal relationship explicitly in ways that he may not have with you or later in life. And this is all I have to show for it. I'm in big trouble. So, when you finally kill me off here at Christ the King, because uh, you're going to have to kill me, because Father won't fire me. I've tried. Um, and the Lord won't let me quit. No, I'm very happy. But what I'm saying is that when I die, masses, masses and candles, okay? Masses, candles, and prayers. What a great guy. I'm probably thinking, oh, I'm not going to say that. Understood. You're the ones that are helping me the most. What a guy in need of God's mercy. Okay. How else can we believe, though? How do we teach our children to believe and our grandchildren to believe, or maybe those people that we love to believe again? We know the famous atheist prayer, Lord, if you're up there, show me. And you know what? He always does, even if you're not an atheist. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the nature of, of, well, going back to the question that we asked last week, who am I, and, and then, but, but more importantly, why am I here? The Baltimore Catechism told us I'm here to know God, to love God, and to serve God in this life, and to be for, forever happy with him in heaven. Now back in the 1880s, I guess they didn't think much of happiness on earth because the Catechism today tells us I was created for happiness both here and in the life to come. I have to cultivate faith. 
He's actually showering on all of us all the time. I have to want to believe, and I have to cultivate that belief. Nobody can just go through the motions of knowing, loving, and serving the living God, and therefore being happy in his presence. And let's bring it down to something that we, that we all understand, or most of us understand. And for this, I'm going to use a prop, and I like to use props in my audience. And I'm going to use the prop, having already used their daughter as a prop earlier, Travis and Kelly Kogel. Travis met Kelly one day and obviously saw what he liked. And so he wanted to, to know her. Tell me when I'm wrong, okay? And so they got to know one another. Because that's what you do when like, you date, or you court, or you know, spark, or whatever word you want to use, okay? You're getting to know someone. At least that's the way it's supposed to work, okay? And you can't know them between 11.30 p.m. and 1.30 a.m. I know everything I need to know. No, you don't, okay? Slow down, okay? So they got to know one another, right? And at some point in knowing one another, they realize they love one another. And, and you really can't explain why you love somebody. Did you ever notice that? Because just like contingency, I love him because he's such a good provider. That's a bad reason to love somebody because they could go belly up broke so you're going to stop loving them. I love him because he's so kind and patient all the time. Said no woman I ever was associated with, number one. But number two, that can change with illness, with misfortune. We just know we love somebody. And it may make no sense to the world as long as it's okay with God, because there are lots of things that don't make sense to the world that just don't make sense. Okay, so let's put, let's put some parameters here. But at some point, Travis knows that he loves Kelly. And Kelly knows that she loves Travis. Right? So far, so good? And then having that kind of love between them, at some point... They made the decision that they wanted to be together in this life until they die. And, and why did they come to that conclusion? So they could buy a house together? That wasn't the reason, was it? So you could have Kristen? <laughs> yeah, right, okay. No. No, just because. And the best way that they express their love for one another, and this is true with all of us here, isn't it, you know, that have this sort of thing going for us. They liked serving one another. And what they found out was that that serving one another made them happy. That serving draws us closer to what we're looking for. So if we want to believe and we want others to believe, yeah, we can give them the five ways and we can have them read the Bible and we can you know, preach the catechism to them and, 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 those, and those are all necessary. Those things are right. I mean, they, they feed that. But ultimately, it has to be a will, a desire for happiness. If I don't want to be happy, my relationship with God is always going to be strained. If, 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 if Kelly and Travis didn't want to be happy with one another, their relationship is going to be strained. Happiness. We come to know some people. Well, let's just jump the gun here. We come to know God. And when you know God, you can't help but love God. I mean, even if you've just got nothing but the Bible version and it really hasn't sunk in yet, you're still going to go, wow, what a great God. So we know God and we love God. We realize that the best way to live is to serve God. And we do. You see, that's what they were doing at the same time they were... They were going through their know, love, and serve with each other. They're growing in their knowledge and love and service of God. See, because God wanted that for them. God wants that for you and I. He doesn't want us to know him because he's an egoist. He doesn't want us to love him because he's a narcissist. He doesn't want us to serve him because he's a sadist but because he knows us, and he loves us, and he serves us. 
And his greatest joy reminds me of something that Father Justin Hamilton posted on his Facebook page on Sunday. He said, one of the greatest joys, and I'm paraphrasing because he said it so beautifully, one of the greatest joys of a parish priest is to celebrate Mass with your parish family and then to watch them after Mass. I can picture this, lingering on the little plaza in front of St. Stanislaus or out there on the lawn in the front walk in front of St. Mary's, watching your parishioners enjoy one another's company. That was my father's greatest delight himself, was watching his children love one another. Our Heavenly Father, his greatest joy in life is watching us love one another and growing in knowledge of one another and serving one another. Not because it's slavish, not because it keeps us under wraps, not because it's a control thing, but because that's what he really wants. Because I'm just going to go on a limb here, Kelly. You look like you could be a famous country singer sometimes. The first time I saw you, I thought, yeah, she looks like she could like be a famous country singer. You could have a tour bus with a full shower, a king size bed, you could go all over, you know. You but without Travis, you wouldn't be happy, right? So. God knows what he's doing. Faith is the belief that goodness is going to happen. That in the end, goodness is going to triumph over evil. That's the essence of our faith. You believe in me because you have seen me, Jesus said to, to Thomas. Blessed are those, happy are those who have not seen me and yet believe. See, we're the lucky ones. We all think, oh, if only I could have lived during Jesus' time. Now, we're the lucky ones. Because we don't get to see. Not the way they saw. We get to just experience and believe. And what good did seeing do them anyway? We spent three years with them, and when the soldiers showed up, they all ran off. Let's wrap this up. Our response is the same response of the man whose son, another demon-plagued son, and the disciples couldn't even cast out the demons from this cat. It was pretty bad. And Jesus said, well, it's because you've got to have faith. Do you believe? The man said, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Lord, we're grateful for this time this evening to once again remind ourselves that what we believe is reasonable and not simply because it's been revealed to us, which it has, but that what has been revealed to us makes so much sense. It is so intuitive when we observe nature and creation, human relationships, the way we, and the things that you have shown us. We know it's reasonable. We know it makes sense. Indeed, Lord, we believe, but help our unbelief and help the unbelief of those who, because they're tired or because the circumstances of the day have, have turned that belief or made it stale or it needs to be rekindled or they've been distracted by something. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Now let's stand together as we sing our prayer with our CCD students and I'm going to just throw out a compliment. Do those kids come in here like champions or what? Yeah. All right. Let's turn to Our Lady, whom we will never be, but that's okay. Because we get to be who we are, each of us. Remember, he loves each one of us as if there were only one of us. And as children, not only of God the Father and brothers and sisters of Jesus and inheritors of the Holy Spirit, we are also children of Mary. And so we turn to her tonight. As together we pray. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita do Cielo, et spes nostra salve. A te clamamus, exules fili eve. Ad te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, in ac lacrimarum alve. Ea ergo, advocata nostra, 
Il los tuos misericordes oculos ad nos converte. E Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, no peace post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, O pia, O dulcis virgo mari.